welcome everyone to this session uh, in which we're going to be talking about hydropower and water technologies. And this is another really, really fascinating area. I'm always surprised at how much new information that there is and how much there is to learn and the enormous uh, uh, amount of, of power and energy that is provided through water technologies and also the huge still untapped resource that we have available. And when you think about what this means in terms of the overall supply chain and jobs, it's really quite phenomenal. So I'm really, really happy that we've got a great panel for you to hear from this afternoon. And we're going to start with Matt Nacella, who is the Manager for Strategic Communications with NHA, the National Hydropower Association. All right, thank you very much, Carol. Good afternoon, everyone. How are we all doing today? I know it's, I know it's right after lunch, and I'm, I just finished eating, so we all get that little, that little lull right after, so I'll try not to bore you too much. Uh, as Carol said, my name is Matthew Nicella. I am the Communications Manager for the National Hydropower Association. We are uh, the trade association that represents the about 200 companies that represent the diverse North American hydropower industry, uh, and that includes all forms of water power, conventional hydropower, small, large, pump storage, in conduit, and even new marine and hydrokinetic technologies. So hydropower is actually our oldest renewable in the United States. It's been around for well over a century, um, and as many of you know, it's history in the West and with uh, federal entities like the Tennessee Valley Authority, it powered our war effort in World War II and helped really get us through the depression with uh, its job creations. And that's something that it can do today as well. So as I said, today hydropower makes up a majority of United States renewables. Uh, it's the largest renewable electricity source in America and it provides about 30 million American homes with clean, reliable electricity every day. So the fleet is interesting in that it's different from a lot of other renewable energy technologies out there in that its ownership, the makeup of its ownership is half federal, federally owned, so that's Tennessee Valley Authority, Bureau of Reclamation, and the Army Corps of Engineers. And the other half is what's referred to as non-federally owned, so that can be investor-owned utilities and even small public powers uh, owners. Uh, and of that, you know, we all think, what's the first thing we think of when we think of hydropower? Anyone? Clean and renewable. Clean. That's the correct answer. <laughs> but most people think Hoover Dam, uh, and that's actually not what the fleet really looks like. Of the, of the projects that are regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, 70% um, are 30 megawatts or lower. So they are generally smaller. Uh, and as this is a perfect segue, thank you for that, Jacob. Uh, the benefits of hydropower, uh, it is. It's clean and renewable, but it's also very reliable. So it's a reliable source of electricity uh, that provides, like I said, 30 million American homes with electricity. These facilities are capable of going quickly from zero to maximum output, uh, making them well suited to meet changing electricity demands throughout the day. Pump storage, which is a type of hydropower where you can actually send the water back up uh, to the upper reservoir and store it for later by pulling electricity off the grid, uh, adds an additional reliability to the electricity grid. It's affordable, uh, low-cost energy re resource as well. Uh, products have long lifespans. Uh, they have low operations and maintenance costs and zero fuel cost. You know, our water runs through these turbines and comes out the other end. And most estimates put hydropower at about two to five cents per kilowatt hour. Like we said, it's clean and renewable. About the equivalent to 40 million passenger cars worth of emissions is avoided every year with hydropower. And uh, beyond the benefits that we see to the electricity grid and our clean air, it also has a huge impact on American families from an economic standpoint. Uh, about 300,000 U.S. workers are employed uh, either directly or indirectly through the, through the hydropower uh, industry, and that's supported by a supply chain. If you look at the map that I have back here, I know it's a little far away, but those red dots are about 2,500 supply chain companies from coast to coast that feed these projects, and that's providing bolts, nuts, turbines, anything that they need to make those projects go. Now I've talked a lot about what we already have for hydropower. It's about 100,000 megawatts of capacity, 20,000 of that is pump storage. But there's also a tremendous uh, potential for hydropower to grow in the United States. 
we have um, our off-sited Navigant consult consulting report found about 60,000 megawatts of untapped potential in various types of technologies throughout the United States, and that could has the ability to create 1.7 million cumulative new jobs. The, now, where where is all this potential coming from? Uh, the number that shocks people a lot is the of the 80,000 dams in the United States, only 3% are generating electricity. And the Department of Energy did a study back in 2012 that looked at the potential at the existing non-powered infrastructure. So they identified about 54,000 dams in the United States with, with uh, capacity of one megawatt or greater, uh, and that totals about 12,000 megawatts. That's roughly the equivalent of 12 new plants. Uh, and two-thirds of that potential is just at the top 100 sites. So if we just built at the top 100 uh, non-powered dams, we could increase uh, hydropower generation by 8%. Uh, then the DOA actually this April uh, expanded on that report and looked at new greenfield development, and they found about 65,000 megawatts of potential. Now this study is off-cited as being um, a call to build new dams, and that's not necessarily the case. It, what it really is meant to do is to show what the universe of potential is out there. And it shows us not only where the potential is, but what are the characteristics of these sites? What are the environmental impacts that would have if they were built? Are there endangered species in the area? So that really informs, helps inform developers as they look at the best sites to uh, sustainably develop hydropower further in the United States. There was also a study that found an additional 1.6 million megawatt hours per year at the uh, Bureau of Reclamation's non-powered infrastructure, and so all these things together show that there's hydropower is not tapped out, and that there's a lot we could be doing uh, to add reliable, clean, affordable electricity to our grid. And this is definitely something that, even though a lot of people aren't aware of, developers are. And we look over at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which uh, licenses these projects, and developers have about 52,000 megawatts of permits or uh, pending licenses at some stage of the regulatory process. Now, are all 52,000 of those going to be built? Probably not. Uh, and there are several reasons for that, and we think that Congress can address a lot of those issues. The first is the regulatory barriers. Uh, hydropower project developers face long development lead times. Uh, the regu regulatory process is quite long, uh, taking up to and beyond five years, uh, and it involves dozens of federal and state agencies. But we've seen some progress on this. Last year, uh, Congress did something that it hasn't done in a while, and that's pass an energy bill. And it was small and targeted, but it was, there were two of them that were passed basically unanimously out of both houses of Congress and signed by the President in August that looked at uh, finding regulatory efficiencies for low-impact hydropower development, including building on non-powered NAMs, trying to get that from a five-year process to a two-year process. And NHA is currently working with uh, the environmental community and other, our membership and members of Congress to see if we can't find additional regulatory efficiencies that we can add to the process. Beyond that, their hydropower projects are very intensive uh, from a capital standpoint up front, so a lot of the cost is uh, when you're building these projects and we need to find a way to leverage private investment in that and the way we do that is through incentive policies like the PTC. Like the other renewables have probably been saying all day, uh, the PTC is extremely important for many of our companies, uh, and we would like to see that extended by the end of the year. Uh, and then finally for hydropower is research and development. Many of the new technologies, smaller technologies in marine and hydrokinetics, the DOE water power program plays a tremendous role in funding those activities. Uh, we've seen unstable funding levels at, Depart at the Department of Energy um, through the congressional appropriations process, but we started to see uh, a, and not to use a pun here, but a sea change in, in the priorities. This year we were happy to see the President actually ask for an increase in the Department of Energy's water power budget, and uh, though we don't know what the Senate numbers are, the House actually on the floor to a few weeks ago when they were voting on the energy and water bill voted to increase the funding for that program by $9 million. So we had an amendment tacked on to that. Beyond all that, the, the research is there that this is a supported technology by uh, the American public, so Congress should be acting. Uh, we found that uh, through a poll done by Princeton Survey Research Associates, Americans support expanding hydropower by 80 percent. 
Um, and seventy percent support the aforementioned policies needed to support that growth. And I see that I am at the end of my time, so I will close and pass on to the next speaker. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, lots more. If we have any time, we'll try and take some questions at the end. Uh, we're now going to turn to um, uh, looking at a case study of great international cooperation. And I think this is just a wonderful example um, in w what you're going to hear about. Um, in so our tag team on this is Jacob Irving, who is the president of Canadian Hydropower Association, and he will be joined by Bill Libro, who is the director of federal affairs with Minnesota Power. Jacob. Thanks. Thanks very much, Carol, and uh, thanks, Matt, too, for, for opening things up. Um, uh, Matt and I, I think we're from, I often call our association, so it's sort of sister associations, the National Hydropower Association in the United States and then the Canadian Hydropower Association up north. Uh, similarly, we represent the developers and the operators of hydro from coast to coast to coast in Canada. And um, we share a lot of the same heritage and, hi heritage and history and the same type of resource uh, generally. But um, in Canada, our ability to grow um, is, is quite large. Um, we are currently the third largest generator of hydropower in the world, and we have the ability to more than double our current installed capacity. And I like to think that that's a good news story, um, both for Canada and for the United States. It's a huge untapped potential of clean renewable electricity, and Further good news, I think, of course, is that our two countries are already very, very strongly linked. Um, in fact, our grids on a continental basis are generally more north-south than they are east-west. So Canada and the United States, our electricity grids have been connected from the beginning. Um, and it's actually happened quite organically over time. It was, I think it was as simple as that we were building electricity generation on this, our side of the border for ourselves, and the U.S. was doing it on their side of the border. And we looked across the border and said, you know, if we string lines across from each other, <laughs> we can actually incre increase each other's reliability and efficiency. And, and so we did, and it made sense. And ever since, we've been sending electricity back and forth to each other. Now, of course, Canada is a net exporter of electricity to the United States. Um, but that pretty much follows the general story in all natural resources between our two countries. Uh, generally, down in this country, uh, there's 10 times as many people as there are in Canada. There's about 350 million people here. There's about 35 million in Canada. Our population is about the size of California's population. Stretches across the second largest land mass on the planet. Um, so we don't have a lot of people by comparison to the United States, uh, but we do have a lot of natural resources and we have a lot of energy potential. And uh, we do currently enjoy a successful relationship in that regard. We send about 30 to 40 terawatt hours of hydropower to the United States every year. And each one of those terawatt hours helps avoid about 500,000 um, megatons of, uh, of carbon. So um, we, uh, in Canada, we satisfy our own needs with electricity, and we have one of the cleanest, most renewable electricity systems in the world, since again, 60% of our electricity comes from that. Um, but then we also send it to the United States. And the United States, by comparison, um, your generation profile in this country, it's about 70% non-renewable um, fossil fuel. And so if you look north to Canada, we like to think that we have a, a friendly solution for you that we can help you with. And you backstop it against the fact that uh, Canadian hydropower represents less than 1% of U.S. electricity consumption. Um, we like to think that there is a reasonable room to grow there. Um, as I often say, you know, I'm not here to say that, that Canada should provide 15% or 10% or even 5% of U.S. electricity supply. But by the same token, we think that 1% is a little bit low and we could probably do a little bit better. And in fact, if we were to dream a lofty dream, a lofty, set ourselves a lofty goal of doubling our exports, that would represent 2% of, of U.S. electricity. And remembering that each of those electrons is clean and renewable, we think is to both of our advantages. 
And of course, our countries enjoy a long and storied um, trade relationship, a peaceful trade relationship. We, we are each other's two largest trading partners. And in terms of economic benefit, um, we derive and offer the same sort of benefit that, that Matt was talking about. We have Canadians working on U.S. hydropower projects. We have Americans working on Canadian hydropower projects. Um, our two associations share uh, many of the same members who are all interested in the common goal, which is essentially bringing on more hydropower generally. Because I think together we do generally share the belief that hydropower is the best way to make electricity. Uh, definitely within Canada, I'm never shy or afraid to mention at any forum that in Canada at least, hydropower is the best way to make electricity. Uh, can we do better? We can always do better. Are we perfect? Nope. No one's perfect. But we are the best. And we are big, and we can grow, and we can share. And I think that's... Uh, that's probably the biggest message that I'd like to leave everybody with today is that we're big, we can grow, and that's good. And in fact, if you, of course, want to get some more information on it and, um, and get a few more uh, facts and arguments, we've got some information outside. So make sure you pick up a copy of Five Reasons Americans Should Care About Canadian Hydropower. Us, us Canadians are always told that um, when, we, when we talk to our American cousins that we should try and be concise and direct. So <laughs> we hope we've achieved that with this. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and, uh, but also, um, I think it is really it is incumbent upon us in Canada to remind ourselves of our great strength in hydro and our ability to grow and also remind our American cousins that um, our existing relationship could and should be expanded for mutual benefit to both of us. Um, I've joked before with Matt sometimes is that uh, we do share some things in common. I think some communications issues are similar. One of them is fighting this notion that hydropower is somehow tapped out. Because it's been around for 130 years, it's well developed, it's well understood. People I think can be forgiven for thinking that, oh well, we must not have any more. Um, and of course, nothing could be further from the truth. And um, I often joke, it's sort of like uh, it's sort of like trying to communicate or advertise oatmeal. Um, you know, it's been around forever. It's plentiful. It's good for you. And now try and get everybody excited about it. That's our job in um, both the NHA and the CHA is to try and essentially remind ourselves of the solution that we have underfoot that we can enable through proper policy and, um, and greater awareness. But um, something else just to think about um, as well, since, we're, since I'm a Canadian in, in the U.S. capital, is every so often it's interesting to take a step back and think about U.S. from a North American perspective, uh, uh, sorry, the hydropower from the North American perspective, and adding our two countries together. We're already connected together. But if you look at stats and rankings, it's kind of interesting. Canada has the fourth largest installed capacity and the third largest generation. And the U.S., it's flipped. The United States has the third largest installed capacity. The U.S. has more installed capacity than we do. But the U.S. has the fourth largest amount of generation. So we're kind of interesting. We kind of fit together. And if you actually took us together and you added us together, we become a strong number two ranking in the world. We are the second largest in terms of install capacity and the second largest in terms of generation. Who is number one? China's number one. China has the largest install capacity and the largest generation. But when you add Canada and the US together, we are nipping at their heels. We are very close. And I would argue that the undeveloped potential that both our countries have put together, that we could catch China and we could exceed China in terms of both install capacity and generation. And I think that's an interesting goal to shoot for. And I think it's an interesting proxy for development on greenhouse gas. Uh, because if we and both our countries can pull together and uh, make it happen, then the, then the sky's the limit, I think, for us in terms of improving our environment and our economy. That gives an overview of Canada. And as Carol mentioned, we're going to talk, we're going to zoom in a little bit more. I've given a real general sense of things. But um, you know, I ended in talking about partnership between our two countries. Uh, Bill Libro and Minnesota Power is actually going to be able to provide an example 
of where Canada and the U.S. have directly partnered together to enable renewables on both sides of our borders. And I think it would be very instructive in uh, telling us all about how we can work together going forward and hit our mutual goals of improving our economies and improving our environment as well. Oh. I'm good. Uh, I'm Bill on the Director of Federal Affairs for Minnesota Power, and uh, it's always nice to be hanging out with somebody who's big and likes to share, so that's a good place for us to be. Uh, Minnesota is really blessed in several ways, not in the middle of winter when it's 30 below, with the wind chill of 90 below, but blessed in the fact that we are bordering the, the Canadians with ample hydropower, and just to our west we have ample wind power. What I want to talk to you today a little bit about is kind of what we're doing to kind of pack those on the, the chairs back there are some uh, handouts that I've provided. Nothing too high tech, but that gives you a little bit of a snapshot of some information about Minnesota Power. First of all, we're a very small investor owned utility headquartered up in Duluth, Minnesota. We serve some of the largest industrial customers in the world in the mining and forest and paper product industries. They demand uh, high reliability for their electricity, they demand low cost, and you've got to make sure that the lights are on 24 7 because they operate. So Jacob talked about the integrated grid and the fact that in fact North America, and you're all electricity geeks, so you wouldn't be here on a nice afternoon listening, sitting in this room. But the North American grid is in fact an integrated grid. And if you look at it from a north-south perspective, we run with the same 60 seconds per second uh, for voltage and current. If you look at the integration, we're running under the same North American Electric Reliability Corporation standards. We're running with some of the same integrated system operators. So it is an integrated grid, and we really need to look at it in that fashion. What Minnesota Power is looking at is, is a build out of wind power in North Dakota, and hooking that wind power up to be an existing direct current or DC line that comes into Duluth from the center of North Dakota, the beautiful city near center of North Dakota at the time. And what we're going to do is marry that with the hydropower from Canada, because one of the things that hydropower can provide is really good, it's called low quality capabilities. Hydropower can move up and down very quickly, so as wind power or any other intermittent moves around, we can integrate that into the grid. And it's really important for you all to just keep in mind that what's happening when you see the lights on here, everything is happening in real time. And that is, in fact, every time you put the light switch on or off, there's a generator somewhere either producing electrons or not producing electrons in real time at the speed of light. So as we generate more or less electricity from an intermittent resource, we'll be integrate that into the grid or into our system, we have to be moving some other generation around to make sure that the lights stay on. And if we don't, bad things happen. So what we're going to do is look at a, a long-term contract which we've signed with Manitoba Hydro. It's going to be for 250 megawatts, which is just a big amount of energy. Uh, it's going to be a contract where we actually built in what's called a wind storage provision. And kind of the holy grail for electricity is storage because we really can't store electricity grid or utility scale, um, at least not. We're going to do it the old-fashioned way, which is by using water, and the power of the water stored in a dam or in a flowing stream. So what we're going to do is, if it's a really windy day, we get a lot of wind out in our Dakota, and we don't have high loads, we don't need all that electricity, we don't necessarily have to take the water, the water power from Canada. They can actually not send us the electrons, meaning they're not spilling water for our behalf, meaning that the water is actually being stored. Okay. And if you think of storage, again, it's not Hoover Dam. It's really dams along several river systems in Canada. And Lake Winnipeg, which is really a pretty darn big battery. So when you look at the, the, uh, some of the diagrams I have, you'll see that we have Canada kind of positioned there as a battery, whereas my friends don't know say battery. <laughs> um, that's what we're going to use that Canadian system for. So it's a perfect example of kind of being in the right spot for us, being at the intersection of water and wind. And I think our engineers being clever enough to figure out that this is going to work for us. It obviously is not going to work for Kansas, all right, or some other places where you just don't have that kind of access. And in fact, in Minnesota, we are the land of 10,000 lakes. We just don't have 10,000 feet of elevation. So we have plenty of water. We just don't have a lot of elevation change to capture that power and moving water. So some availability there, but nothing compared to what our friends have. So being big and powerful, as Jacob is, um, we're going to look at being able to partner use that, use it well, provide our customers who need
cost-effective electricity and reliable electricity with cost-effective and reliable electricity. That's our story. I'm sticking to it. If you have any questions, you can always contact me down here in town. I really appreciate all of you coming out today. It's been a nice afternoon. And I have to run and go take a conference call, so I apologize to my fellow panelists. I don't want to hear what they say, but the powerful Jacob has said you'll report back. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thanks, Bill. <laughs>
kind of rush of robotics doing pipeline repair. Unaccounted for water or unbilled water. That's what the water authorities use to say, we've made X amount of water and we've billed for Y amount of water. That difference used to be 30% unaccounted for. Basically around the country, it's down in the 18 to 20% range. I mean, it's outrageous that one bit of that huge amount of energy we're using because the product is leaking before it actually gets to the consumer. So there are a lot of things we're seeing that the utilities are getting a little smarter. And what we see is conservation programs will remain the lowest cost of new supply. So the conundrum we have in this country is that one third of the country is in an incredible water deficit. Might not be every year, but long term, a third of the country doesn't have enough water. So they need to invest very wisely in their conservation and efficiency programs that are significantly the lowest cost of new supply. The difficulty is that two thirds of the and so you go into a community and you cut 20% of the flow because we just want to be more efficient. Well, now the rates have to go up a lot more than 20%. Because the main difference between water, wastewater, and the stormwater community is that the cost of the infrastructure is 80% of your cost. And utilities, typically 80% of your cost, but for hydro, is in the commodity itself. So we're going to see a lot more reuse, recycling, uh, and what we will probably start to see in the next four to five years, if not earlier, in the real water deficit areas, is. Uh, People used to call them toilets and tap. We don't want any of that waste water in our drinking water. And, you know, basically we all fill it many times. But that we're going to see the effluent from the wastewater treatment plants being put right into our water supply. So, Getting back to big picture, average energy cost of about 40 cents for every thousand gallons, or more correctly, about 40 cents for every 8,000 pounds of water that we move around the country. And people ask, why does water cost so much in these areas where it gets? Well, people say, come on, God gives it to us, it's free. Well, you can come down to any of the plants and they'll give you a five-gallon bucket and you can carry it home. But if you actually want that product transported to your facility, it takes a lot of energy. And so, I think the only, to close up, people that use the commons for private gain, they need to be held responsible for their activities. And I'm not directly referring to the fracking people because they've screwed up the water around the country in specific locations. I was a Boy Scout. We were told that if you use the commons, you have to leave it in better shape than when you went in. And I think we're going to see that next leap in corporate responsibility. OK, thank you. And sorry, we're going to have to do kind of an expedited presentation here, Jason. But anyway, we are now going to hear about this uh, very important uh, other area of, of water technologies, water power, from Jason, from Jason Bush, who is board member of, of OREC, the Ocean Renewable Energy Coalition, and the executive director of the Oregon Wave Energy Trust. Thank you. 
anticipated my running out, running out of time, so I'll, I'll make my comments short, and I'm happy to stick around afterwards. Uh, my name is Jason Bush, Executive Director of the Oregon Wave Energy Trust, uh, and given that I came out from Oregon, the land of hydro, you might think I'm here to talk about conventional hydro. In fact, I'm here as, in my capacity as an as a MHK, a marine hydrokinetic advocate. I'm a board member of the Ocean Renewable Energy Coalition. Uh, we are a national trade group that promotes the development of energy from, uh, from the ocean, from waves, tides, currents. Uh, even uh, salinity gradients and temperature gradients. Uh, these are pre-commercial technologies. Uh, we're still probably three to five years from seeing the first technologies uh, go in the water uh, and put electricity on the grid permanently. Um, and so in many ways, we're, we're certainly different than some of the folks you've already heard from today who've focused on things like solar and, and wind and, and, and certainly conventional hydro. Um, we're very interested in this particular type of generation because of the tremendous potential that is out there, not just in the United States, but around the world. Uh, we certainly want to be one of the first countries in the world that help develop these technologies and bring them to market. Um, and we certainly want to put clean, reliable electricity on the grid in the United States. Um, but ultimately, it's a, an, an effort to provide these technologies for countries around the world uh, as we uh, uh, double our energy usage uh, as, as a people on this planet over the next 50 years. Um, uh, MHK should be, marine hydrokinetic should be one of those, uh, one of those sources. Um, the, uh, the industry is uh, only a few years old, about 10 or 15 years old. Uh, Scotland has uh, made a major investment in this over the last few years. Uh, they're really the home of uh, marine hydrokinetic energy, but here in the United States, I think we're a fast follower. It's a good place to be. Uh, we have not invested nearly as much money as uh, they have in the UK and, and in other countries around the world. Um, but we have a number of companies that are tracking toward uh, uh, commercial deployments. Um, already there are, uh, there's a, I think there's a device actually going in the water this week uh, in Massachusetts. Um, and we are tracking four projects on the west coast. Uh, currently there are uh, projects uh, tracking in Alaska, uh, Hawaii, California, Oregon, and Washington. Uh, we are particularly focused on markets like Alaska and Hawaii where the cost of energy is very high. They're importing diesel fuel, burning it in generators. Uh, and uh, their cost of electricity in many pla places exceeds 30 cents a kilowatt hour, as much as 60 cents a kilowatt hour in some of the more remote areas in Alaska. Uh, certainly marine hydrokinetic energy uh, cannot compete today with some of the established forms of renewable energy, uh, but we can certainly beat 60 cents a kilowatt hour, and for uh, communities around the, the country, uh, we, we, in Alaska and Hawaii in particular, we think we're a, uh, a viable option. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the primary focus of our industry right now is uh, getting projects in the water, uh, growing familiarity with the technology. Uh, for many folks, of course, they really don't know anything about marine hydrokinetic energy. You say we do wave energy, they really have no idea what that means, uh, or even tidal currents. Um, these technologies all exist uh, around the world. There are devices in the water. Uh, still in development phases primarily. There are only a handful of, of uh, commercial projects anywhere in, in the world. Uh, one of the, the models that we're trying to replicate here in the United States is something called the European, European Marine Energy Center, EMEC, which is in Scotland. Uh, they is essentially a testing facility. There are 14 berths there. Uh, they're full or contracted for. Uh, an, an entire industry is built up around that testing facility. Uh, and uh, we are trying to do the same thing here in the United States. Uh, we are looking at potential facilities in, in places like Oregon and Hawaii uh, and out here on the East Coast as well. Um, again, I know we're running short on time, so I'll keep it very short. Um, we're, we expect uh, the, um, the water power budget at Department of Energy, as, uh, as it has been for the last few years, has grown. Uh, I think it started in 2008, new again for the first time. Uh, it funds both conventional and marine hydrokinetic, uh, and we work closely with NHA and others to try to grow that budget. Uh, it's the primary source of funding for the research and development for this early stage technology. Uh, so I'll stop there, and I'm happy to stick around afterwards and answer any of your questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Jason. Really appreciate it. So I hope um, that uh, since we are 
uh, right on time. Um, that if you've got questions, please you know feel free to follow up with our speakers, uh, probably out in the hall or at their booths, uh, which would be great because they all got so much information that I think is so important as we think about the kinds of changes that are underway and that can make such a difference for moving to a clean energy economy in this country. So thank you, our wonderful panel. Thank you for squeezing that presentation, Jason. And, um, and I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.